Well, hello to everyone who has joined us for today's webinar. My name is Jack Zenger, and out of deference to my Swiss ancestry, we will begin very promptly on time. I'm here in our office uh, with my colleague, Joe Folkman. Very rarely do the two of us get into the office at the same time. Uh, we are been, we've been pretty good about practicing our social distancing. Uh, today's webinar is uh, entitled Leaders Under Pressure, Finding the Essential Skills for a New Era. We're also joined by a colleague, Dan Mattingly, who happens to be in Indiana. And Dan will be the one that will be handling our chat room. And so I'm gonna turn just a second over here to, to Dan to just explain to you what he would hope that you could do and what you can expect from him. So Dan, tell us. Jack, and uh, hello everybody. And thank you again for joining us today. As uh, Jack said, please use the chat tool to ask questions as the, uh, as the webinar proceeds. And I'll do my best to uh, quickly get back to you with a response. I also look forward to sharing with you a few final pieces of information uh, as we near the end of the webinar. Thanks, Dan. And so to get us started, I'm gonna turn to Joe, who will explain about our technology for conducting polls. Thanks so much, Jack. And hello, all my friends and, and colleagues out there. Um, we're excited to join you today. We wanna to do a little polling. And the way you do this is, the easiest way is uh, if you're on a laptop, just bring up another window, uh, put in the site, pollev.com slash strengths. You need the slash strengths. And it'll ask you a bunch of annoying questions <laughs> that you can just bypass. Uh, you don't need to put in your name or anything like that. Uh, you can also text in by texting the word strengths to the number 22333. And uh, we can kind of uh, enjoy this together just by seeing how you respond. This first poll, you can, uh, you can actually respond three times, uh, given the differences in, in how we're feeling sometimes during the day, you know, we feel a different way. Uh, so are you feeling energized and passionate about your job? A little anxious <laughs> and worried, uh, but okay, and hitting the uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic wall. <laughs> Jack, we, we wrote an article about that. We thought it was kind of a clever way. You, you know, when you're, when you're running an, a marathon, there's a point about 20 miles where you just lose it. You run out of energy and that's the wall. And uh, I think, uh, wow, that's interesting. Uh, so our biggest percentage there is 44% uh, saying a little anxious, a little worried, but okay. And 20% hitting the wall and 36% fully energized. That's, that's great. That's wonderful. Well, we're gonna do this a lot during the, the presentation here. So, so hang in there with us. All right. I think most of us on this call probably will recall back in 2008, 2009, the, the financial crisis that we all experienced. Um, banks were subjected to what was referred to as stress tests. Uh, these were various scenarios that would kind of have the, ex how the bank would perform under a variety of really stressful situations. Uh, and as we all know, the outcome was that for most of the big banks, uh, they needed to increase their reserves. They needed to change their credit practices. They just needed to reduce their risks. That idea of kind of stress tests really does kind of lead us into our current situation. Uh, there has been this sudden worldwide crisis on multiple dimensions. People's personal health and emotional well being has been affected. Our economic well-being has been strongly affected. Corporate economic well-being and survival has been put into question. Uh, it has, in general, had an extended and really pervasive impact on our daily lives. How often and where and how we meet 
uh, where and how we go to work or go to school, where we can travel, on and on and on. The COVID-19 experience has really had strong influence on us. It's had a negative impact on nearly everyone. And my colleague, Joe Folkman, has done some very interesting research showing that there's been a strongly increased anxiety and concern on the part of many people. And we think it, we, we know it's created a need for more skillful execution of a few key leadership behaviors. You know, Jack, uh, you think about it and you think, gosh, this is not a good time to assess myself or to think about my leadership. But in some ways, it's the best time because you're in the middle of that stress test. And what a better time to kind of get an assessment of how you're doing. So let's get a little data on, you know, kind of what you're feeling right now. Uh, you can mark with all the, uh, the responses here you agree with. Uh, are you working remotely uh, or financial results down uh, in your business this year? Many people work uh, you work with are frustrated and worried. Productivity of employees in our business is lower this year. Sometimes uh, people say they're more productive working from home. And some people in our organization are frustrated with their managers or supervisors. <laughs> okay, that's a good question too. So how are you coming out on that? Well, uh, gee, this is interesting, Jack, because this pretty much uh, is, is, is kind of consistent with what we're finding about uh, over a little over 60% of the people are working remotely, uh, 64 in the survey here. That's, that's, that's pretty consistent. Um, you know, the, the second highest is, uh, you know, many people are frustrated or worried. You know, the, the great thing, uh, uh, option E, uh, some people in the organization are frustrated. We find that the number one factor affecting whether people enjoyed working from home or whether they were engaged was their satisfaction with their, their direct manager. And if, if, uh, if they were frustrated, that really had a negative effect on them. Let me show you some uh, results here on this. Uh, you know, as we tried to think about the, the behaviors that would make a big difference in the pandemic, we thought there was a couple of ways to, to kind of understand those. One is to speculate, another is to theorize, or a third is to just guess. <laughs> but that's, that's not us. Uh, you know, we've looked at the data. And what's great about what we've done is we gathered data before the pandemic and now we've gathered data in the pandemic and we sort of looked at that data to try and understand what was going on. So we did two uh, research projects. The first is a study we did after, after March 1st and it was the top management team of a global corporation. Now these were the, the top leaders and we wanted to see what behaviors really affected uh, their performance and affected their performance the most. The second data set was at 1,200 leaders where data was gathered from March to July 2020. And we had about 50% of them were US-based, the others scattered across the globe. We compared these leaders to our database of 110,000 leaders and calculated percentile scores. And then we looked at the best leaders, those that were above average, and then we compared them to those below average. And what we were looking for were the skills that most differentiated them. And we found 10 skills. After we found 10 skills, Jack asked a difficult question. He usually does that. It's like, well, that's interesting. But what I really care about is what's different today. And so we did some more analysis on it and we, we tried to look at which of the behaviors really shifted from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, really made a significant shift. And what we came up with were five skills that made a huge difference. And let me show you the effect of those five skills. And really those five skills boil down into nine survey items. So nine, nine items that people were assessed on, that's not a lot of items, 
But if we looked at how people performed on just those nine items, and we took the below average group on the nine items, and then looked at your overall average rating on all the behaviors we measured, the below average group was at the 36th percentile for our top management group, and it was the 68th percentile for those that were above average, for just that was the top management group. On the, the group of 1,200 leaders, you can see that the below average group was at the 27th percentile, the above average group at the 76th percentile. The, the point this is making is these, these nine behaviors have an amazing effect on how you're perceived as a leader. If we know how you're doing on these nine behaviors, it gives us a real good indication on how you're gonna do overall. And so, as you think about this, uh, these are the five skills. Jack, talk about these skills. You bet. <clears throat> so, early in this webinar, we wanted to share with you the results of our research. And as Joe has indicated, there were five skills that our research for on both this top executive team as well as a much larger group of, of leaders from a variety of organizations. These five skills were the ones that came to the top. They were, and, and we'll talk about each of them in more detail later on in the webinar, but the first one was balancing, the res balancing achieving results with the individual needs of the people in the organization. Our sense was that, you know, prior to the pandemic, there were successful leaders, very effective leaders, who were very driven, very focused on results. And then there were some who were also very focused on building relationships and strong relationships. What really came out of our research now was the most effective leaders were those who were doing both of these with a very good balance. The second thing we learned was that in this pandemic world with people operating from home and remotely was that cooperation among the different teams and departments of an organization rose to the top. But getting cooperation from other parts of the organization became a very important skill. The third was that the leaders who were most effective at this time were those who brought to their, their role a high level of energy and enthusiasm. Um, there's just no question that this uncertainty creates anxiety for employees. They're desperate to hear a reassuring, calming voice, and also a voice that gives them hope. Uh, and optimism about the future. The fourth skill was one about a, an ability to help the organization understand the organization's vision. Let's face it, many organizations have had to pivot and move to a whole different strategy. Uh, and so for survival in this, in this pandemic world, Organizations have had to make a lot of tactical changes, and in many cases, some pretty strategic changes. That can be really confusing, especially to people who are off working up from home and not having day-to-day -day interaction with the senior executives or with each other. So helping others understand what that vision is was the fourth important skill. And finally, it was this ability to really recognize where and when change was needed. This pandemic has required a number of important shifts and how, how rapidly, how adroitly people were able to make this change became a, a really important skill in today's world. So Joe, what's the impact of these skills? Can you let us know? Uh, they're really significant, Jack. I mean, uh, we looked at uh, first the impact on engagement. And again, using just the five skills, those nine items, we looked at people whose score was in the bottom 10% or the top 10% and then the, the degrees in between that. 
And as you look at employee engagement, which is uh, in employees, and this is their direct report, satisfaction, their willingness to give more effort, their willingness to not quit, those kinds of things. You can see that uh, if you scored very low at the bottom 10%, the engagement level of those employees was a 22nd percentile, but those in the top 10% was the 83rd percentile, and, and then that group below them, 68th percentile. So there's a strong effect, and you know, the higher levels of engagement if you, if you perform those five skills well. And this next graph looks at the confidence people have that the organization will achieve its goals. Now, you'd think that people could be object, objective about that, that just because your supervisor is very skillful doesn't mean you're going to have more confidence in the company, but you're wrong. <laughs> because if your manager or your leader is really competent, you know, then 79% of the people feel that, you know, they're, that, that that's the percentage that were highly confident that your, your organization's going to be successful. Uh, and in a, again, if you're not very good, only 13% are confident. And the last one here looks at uh, the five skills. And then it looks at the percentage of direct reports that think about quitting. Now, you're right. A lot, most of these people aren't going to quit today. <laughs> you know? But when they get that chance, this is, this is a, a, you know, a watershed moment for them where they're, they're going to remember that. So 62% that worked for a really poor leader were thinking about quitting. Only 8% of those that worked for the best leaders were thinking about quitting. The point here is, is these skills, they produce an outcome. And so, you know, improving those skills improves the outcome. So let's just talk a little bit about some observations about these five skills. No one of them is kind of brand new or a bolt from lightning from outside the world. Uh, we, we know that these were skills that the most effective leaders were practicing in this pandemic period. So as we review them in a little more, more detail, we're assuming that the, one of the reasons you've decided to tune into this webinar today is that you'd like to know, what do I need to do? What do I need to change or emphasize to be most effective in this period? So we'd like you, as we think about these and as we review them, to give you maybe some way to think about, well, which one maybe has the greatest relevance to you? What's the one behavior that would help you the most right now? We're gonna suggest to you maybe a, a threefold way to kind of think about it. One is, what are, what are my strengths? What do I do really well? Um, having a fatal flaw on any one of these five behaviors could significantly impact your effectiveness. And being really effective at these five skills is really gonna help you to be very, very successful. So one is, what are you, what's your current level of competence capability? The second one is, thinking about your organization, what does the organization need from you? What can you individually and uniquely be providing to the organization at this time? If you were to make a, a significant improvement in any one of these skills, which would have the greatest impact in your job today? And the third consideration we believe is, which of these skills do you have the, the highest level of passion to improve? Now we know we're asking a lot of you. We're asking you to kind of think about these, these, these skills in from three different directions. And so it's a little bit like asking you to walk and chew gum and rub your stomach at the same time. Three different things, but it is. Where are your strengths? Where are you most competent? What does the organization need? And where are you most passionate? So as we review these five skills, please think about these these three dimensions or ways of, of observing which one of these could be of greatest 
value to you. So with that background, let's talk about each of them in a little more detail. The first one again is this ability to balance obtaining good results with a balance of being concerned about the individual needs of people. The item in our research that kind of described this was a person who is a leader who is being trusted by everyone with whom he or she works. And secondly, that they're, that they're balancing this ability to get results with the needs of other people. I had this fascinating conversation from somebody who connected with me on LinkedIn. <clears throat> he was looking for someone to kind of work with him as a, an executive coach. And as he described what had happened to him that had brought him to this point, he said, I spent the last 15 years living with computers and monitors and software that helps me understand better supply chain and, and how to make that more efficient. And then I began to realize that all that was important but the way I was able to get things done in the organization was because I was concerned about the people. And I decided I needed to really strengthen my interpersonal, my, my people skills. And I thought, boy, that, that's a wonderful insight for somebody to have on his own. And so he kind of approached uh, his, his boss and his organization with his own desire to get better balance because he saw the need for balancing individuals' needs with his ability to get results. Joe, talk about the second one. I will. And you know, Jack, just, just that, that recollection there that that was the number one biggest difference, right? That, that, I mean, I think a lot of times when, when we jumped into this crisis, people, People needed uh, a little concern, a little co more consideration. They need some sensitivity from their boss. And that was different than before. Uh, the second one is interesting. It's cooperation from people in other parts of the organization. What's fascinating here is, as you think about it, and you were in that office situation, and you walk down the hall, and you'd see the IT person, and you'd see, or you'd see somebody from another function, and you'd check in with them, and how you doing, and what's this, and hey, what about that project we're working on? It's amazing how much collaborative work got done just by walking around an office. And what's interesting today is that 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 item resolves conflict within the team is the number one most negative item in our post-pandemic data, in our pandemic data, I'm sorry. Uh, we're seeing a lot of conflicts arise, and, and I see this myself. As I'm <laughs> usually sitting alone in, in our offices, I, I, you know, and, and I, I get an email from somebody and I kind of go, rah, 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 you know, kind of get upset. And I, I'm, I'm I, you know, what's interesting is I wouldn't have got upset before because I, you know, usually people would have walked in and said, hey, how you doing? And they would have said it. But the email, I, you know, and p people are reacting to things. The other thing is it's harder than ever to get stuff done. It's harder than ever to get work, groups to work together because they're separate. Working remotely is tough. And it's always been tough. Uh, you know, actually, we've never been great at it. But right now, we really, really, really need it. And this is a huge area, and those people that can do this, those leaders that can really get the collaboration going, are going to be a lot more successful now. Jack, what about this next one? Yes. So the, the third skill was this ability to bring a high level of energy and enthusiasm to the group with whom you're working. You know, we all know that this COVID virus is extremely contagious. Actually though, when, when people are exposed to it, a relatively small percentage actually uh, become very ill. Uh, so it, it has a, a, a very strong effect on a 
you know, a small portion of the, of the people who get exposed. Uh, but one thing we know that has an enormously high level of contagion and that seems to affect nearly everyone is the leader's level of energy and enthusiasm. So when a leader brings to a group a high level of excitement and energy and enthusiasm, virtually everyone is affected. There is an enormously high level of contagion from someone who does that. The leader's behavior energizes people to accept, to, to achieve exceptional results. I think about the, the ER physician who works tirelessly, long hours, and what his or her behavior does to all the people around them. Uh, they don't give rah-rah speeches, but it's their obvious concern, love for the people that they're um, working with and treating that clearly influences their behavior. So the third piece of research that we think is really instructive is people are strongly influenced by your level of excitement, your level of enthusiasm, your optimism uh, makes a big difference in the performance of your work group. And Jack, we just uh, wrote a, a Harvard HBR blog on this and it's not published yet, but we we listed in that eight ways that you can be more inspiring. So, hey, keep your eyes open for that. It's, a, it's an interesting thing because these are common behaviors, but they're really uncommonly practiced. Uh, the next one is helping people's, uh, people understand the vision, the organization's vision. And my analogy for this is a little event that happened at home. Uh, my wife loves to, to uh, uh, you know, take portraits and take uh, landscapes and things like that. And I think she's practicing up to be a professional forger. You know, it's, it's our retirement plan. Anyway, she's not that good yet. But what's interesting is, is that she is, does a really good job of, of really duplicating pictures and painting them. And she gets some really famous pictures and some nice shots. And, and she's really good at doing them. And it's not that hard. Recently, uh, she painted some abstract art. And so this is just like circles and squares. And, and I kept looking at it and I said, I see a duck over here and a squirrel, here. <laughs> you know, it was just a bunch of objects. What was fascinating was it was incredibly difficult because she couldn't get the vision of it. I mean, she always had to look back at the original back over and over and over again because she didn't have any schema of what this thing, you know, there's, there's no sense that it made to her. And I got thinking about this and I thought about this pandemic we're in and what your people are seeing. And they're not seeing this landscape. They're not seeing this portrait. They're seeing abstract art. They're seeing a bunch of circles and squares. Doesn't make any sense to them. And that's why you as a leader, need to constantly help them see the picture, see the vision. Here's where we're going. Lots of things have changed and, and the organization isn't the same as it was. And if you said it once, that's not enough. You need to con constantly be helping people see the vision, where they're headed and how they're gonna get there. And one last thing, and Jack, talk about the need for change. Yes, so the, the fifth skill was this ability to quickly recognize uh, where and when change is needed. I live in a relatively small town and I was really interested to watch what happened to some of the new restaurants that had opened in our, in our town. Shortly after the pandemic uh, became so visible and we were getting recommendations to stay at home and, and uh, it, it changed the way we, we lived. Uh, one restaurant decided just to close its doors. Another restaurant decided to have takeout food available. 
and you could call and make a and put in an order for a family dinner or for something special. They had a very efficient way for you to stop by and pick it up. And they really flourished during virtually all this period of uh, the, the, you know, the, the pandemic was having such a powerful effect on, on the restaurant industry. Uh, as most of you on this call know, we're in the leadership development business. We've observed that a number of our clients have kind of just kind of stopped and just been almost kind of paralyzed about what they're going to do. Other clients said, hey, this is the new normal. Uh, we need to kind of make a strong pivot and begin to have a virtual delivery of whatever we want to do in the way of development. And they've made a very you know, rapid and abrupt change. And they've adopted the use of visual, virtual delivery. Um, and it's just interesting to see the, the dramatic difference in those organizations. The, the latter group kind of recognized the situation. They recognized the need for change. And they had the courage to make the change. And they did it quickly. You know, Jack, I was on a call last week with uh, a group of people from uh, one of our clients who had continued to go through the training. And what's interesting was how, how really grateful the people were to have the training during this period because they said, gee, this is a test and now we know how, we, we know if we've passed the test. So it's interesting what goes on there. Uh, let's do a poll here. <laughs> All right, which of the five skills, if done poorly, has the most negative impact on you? Which one would you, which one, and you can only vote for one on this, so it'll be interesting to see what's coming out in, in the lead here. Uh, okay, which one has the most negative impact? Well, about 40%. It, it, and, and this was consistent, Jack, with uh, our findings that that was the number one thing, just this balancing and people needing a, a little more sensitivity, a little more concern and consideration. But the, then the next highest one is, is the last one, the change. <laughs> Boy, have we had enough changes? <laughs> I think so. It's been just amazing, the changes that we've all gone through. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, the impact of strengths. And, 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 and what I want to kind of show you, because we have so much data, we're able to simulate the effects of people making progress or having a fatal flaw. So let me show you the impact. And, and for this, we're going to talk a little bit about how we define things. So we talk that there's a difference between a weakness and a fatal flaw. That's one of the things. We, and a fatal flaw is a skill at the 10th percentile or lower. It's something you're terrible at. And one of the things we all know is we all have weaknesses, but we don't all have fatal flaws. Uh, here's the effect if you have one fatal flaw in any of the five skills. Your average effectiveness is at the 27th percentile. Uh, Jack, what advice would you give a person if they have a fatal flaw? Boy, it's pretty pretty clear. You need to start there, and you need to fix it. Yeah, fix it, fix it. So, what if you don't have a fatal flaw, and you kind of work on your weaknesses, and maybe you get two of those things above average? What's the effect of that? If you're above average on two of the five, well, you get to the 46th percentile. So just being above average, eh, that's, that's a little bit helpful. But what would happen if you're really pretty good at something, 75th percentile? Let's say you're really pretty good at one thing. Uh, the impact of that moves you to the 58th percentile. And as you think about the logic here is, you could be a, above average on two, it gets you to the 46th. <laughs> 75th percentile on one gets you to the 58th. On two, it gets you to the 75th or first percentile. So then the next category is a strength. And we define a strength as a competency or a skill at the 90th percentile, top 
So what would happen if you do one thing well, one skill, if, if one of the five things you're really terrific at it? Well, that moves you on average to the 79th percentile, two to the 88th, three to the 92nd, four to the 97th, and at five, you become Mary Poppy, Poppins, practically perfect in every way. So uh, what we're trying to demonstrate here is our emphasis that really, if you think about it, this is a tough time. And what, do we, what, what, what would we recommend you do? Hey, if you could take one of these skills and make it a profound strength, you're above you're in the, in the top 25% of leaders, just one. Two gives you the 88th percentile. So we really think that if you boil this down and say, I don't need to be really great at five things, hey, if I could be really good at one, I'm in the top 25%. Jack, what would you add to that? Anything? No, that's, yeah. I've babbled on long enough. Okay. <laughs> so, in your organization, what do people do? Do they focus around, is, is it more of an emphasized weakness or is it building strength kind of a culture? Ah, we have a horse race going here. Oh my gosh, <laughs> who's gonna win? Well, what's interesting is, is uh, it's a little bit like the weakness culture is, is beating, uh, uh, 56 to 44. Uh, that's interesting. You know, we feel that and, and, and from a lot of our clients, we've noticed that that's a strong thing. What we've said to people is this idea of building strengths, again, it can have a positive effect in the organization. Remember, our advice to people if they have a fatal flaw is that takes priority. They need to work on that first. So we do emphasize that. So Let's talk a little bit about how you might build a strength. Jack, tell us about this process. It's different. Than yes. <clears throat> so for the next few minutes, we want to talk to you about, hopefully you've, you've selected something that you might want to improve and work on. Uh, and how do you go about doing that? So it, there's an obvious kind of linear approach to Im improving some behavior, some skill. Uh, for example, if, if you were wanting to display and exude greater enthusiasm and energy, you know, people might initially think, well, I just need to be more extroverted. Or maybe I, we need to have some sort of campaign in the company. We'll have balloons and we'll have wall charts and we'll print some t-shirts and we'll kind of do some things that will kind of make this into a, a real initiative or a campaign. Or maybe we need to kind of hold more all hands meetings and, and have more frequent interaction with our people. So there are, there are a variety of things that we would describe as kind of pretty obvious, pretty linear kinds of behaviors that would go along with this objective of displaying more energy and enthusiasm. That, but that makes that you all there is, I mean, is, is there, is that the only way to do that? And we're going to kind of talk with you about, no, that isn't the only way. And those may not be the most powerful, most productive ways to go about it. We want to describe to you now in the next few minutes, just some research that we've done around, are there alternative paths to changing behavior? Uh, and Joe's going to describe that for you. The example I'm going to use is my old truck. <laughs> so uh, it's got a five-speed speed transmission. And uh, first gear, I call first gear granny. Because <laughs> granny moves slow, right? I mean, it, I mean, you put that in first gear, it, it'll pull out a tree trunk or something like that. But it really crawls. Now, if you want to go faster, there's two options. You can press on the gas but you're in first gear, it does almost nothing. It, it may ruin the engine if you press too much because you'll throw a rod. But uh, you know it, it, that helps you a little bit, but really the way you get to move faster is shifting. 
and you shift to second. And then by the time you get to fifth gear, this thing's purn along. At, you know, it goes six, 65 miles an hour in fifth gear, and it just it just is purring along. And you know, the analogy is that there's something like that. There's this this interesting effect that occurs. And what we found in our research is one behavior or one capability affects another, that there's an interaction effect between two behaviors. And if you can understand these interaction effects, you can understand another way of improving, and we think a better way of improving, because this is how you build a strength. If you go back here, Yes, you can be more extroverted and have more balloons and on hand meanings, but there's a point where, you know, that's not going to help. It, linear stuff gets you halfway there, but it doesn't get you all the way there. So what does that? And I have some examples for you. Let's take two capabilities or two skills. One is energy and enthusiasm. The other is set stretch goals. Okay. Now, we're going to focus on energy and enthusiasm, but if you were pretty good at that 75th percentile, but you weren't uh, as good at setting stretch goals, you were below the 75th percentile, the probability that you'd be a great leader at the 90th percentile is only 3%. In other words, there's a 3% chance of you being a great leader if you're good at A, but not at B. <laughs> That's those are not good odds, 3%. That's not good odds. So let's look at B, not A. So let's say that you're pretty good at sex goals, not so good at energy and enthusiasm. What's the chances you're going to be a great leader? 2%. <laughs> it's worse. So wonder if you did both well. And if you did both, they're both above the 75th percentile. So energy and enthusiasm, you're really pretty good at that. Stretch goals, you're really pretty good at that. You know, there's a 3% on one, there's 2% on the other, you'd expect 5%. But when you look at the interaction effect between this, you actually get 95%. In other words, 95% of the leaders that are in the top 10% have both of these skills at the 75th percentile. See, one helps you be better at the other. Setting stretch goals gets people to try something hard. And when they do something hard, they go, gosh, I, I accomplished something that was impossible, I thought. And that really makes them feel like you've got more energy and enthusiasm if you can get them to accept that stretch goal. Here's another one. Let me show you what this one does. Communicates powerfully. Again, the probability of just energy and enthusiasm, 3%. The probability of communicates powerfully, 2% combine five, but really it's 94%. This is the interaction effect. And what we're saying here is that these skills, setting stretch goals and communicating powerfully help you to be perceived as having energy and enthusiasm. And these two things are a little more helpful or, or you, you, can, you can know how to develop them. So Jack, show us a little bit about this research that we did. Right. <clears throat> so over the past few years, we have been able to accumulate some one and a half million 360 degree feedback instruments pertaining to about 110,000 leaders. These are leaders all over the world in all kinds of industries. Uh, and we've has, we have this massive database that allows us to begin to look at, so are there some powerful combinations that would give us some good clues about what would somebody who wants to get more, be more effective at any one of these five skills, what might they do? So for example, on the one that we've talked about a little bit here, energy and enthusiasm, our research shows that the person who is perceived as being capable and, and who, who displays high energy enthusiasm, as has been mentioned, sets stretch goals. They communicate more, more frequently, more transparently. 
they are very effective at being collaborative, practicing teamwork. They're very inclined toward innovation. And so some of these are very obvious, but for example, one that in my opinion isn't quite so obvious is the person who's perceived as being highly energetic and enthusiastic develops, consciously develops his or her subordinates. So this willingness to kind of be concerned about their development, carve out time for them, make available developmental opportunities. The organization that doesn't just close the doors and give up on development during a difficult period, but who really pursues the development of their, of their people. They are the managers, they are the leaders who are perceived as displaying high levels of energy and enthusiasm. So what we're here to explain to you is that for each of those five skills that we have described, we do have research that describes these companion capabilities, these companion behaviors that seem to create this powerful combination to help people be seen and to really practice each of those five skills better. And, and Jack, just a note here that for those of you that are familiar with our research on this, what we're showing you is some research we did where we created a simplified model of companion behaviors with just three to five companion behaviors. In our original research, we actually found 10 but what we're providing with this uh, research here is some simplified versions of this. The other thing to keep in mind is to be better at energy and enthusiasm, you don't need to do all five things. You could just pick one or two of those things, but those give you some concrete actions you can take. Well, as you think about those five things, which ones would you recommend or which ones would you uh, select that would help you to be more inspiring. And uh, it's interesting, I, I love that, you know, uh, communicates powerfully. You know, that's, that's low hanging fruit, isn't it? It's such a good one, uh, you know, if we communicate. And one of the things we'd encourage you people that are gonna communicate to do is uh, to, to, while you're talking, also listen. <laughs> you know. <laughs> We wrote an article about that. But the second one is develops others. And, and uh, we've actually, we just did some research on the pandemic and, and on, on uh, inspiring. And we found that to be the number one most powerful. Uh, so 40% communicates, 28%. Jack, any surprises here? Well, no surprises. And, and by the way, to all who are on this webinar today, we know that there's been a little bit of frustration about the fact that the polls kind of got closed and that it only would accept a certain number of responses. We apologize for that. That's just one of those technical glitches that to become part of our reality. We're sorry about that. Oops. So we appreciate you having weighed in on all these polls that we've been conducting. Zach, tell us about the development yeah. guide. So as, as we've already mentioned, we have developed a developmental guide that sort of sum, that summarizes this research. And we're going to let Dan kind of explain to you how you might have access to this and how this all would work. So Dan, I'm going to toss the ball to you and let you kind of explain all that to our, to our guests. Oh, one more thing before Dan does that, and that's our quote. <laughs> 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 so, uh, and I love this quote, one person's disaster is another person's learning opportunity. Jack, you have, you say something, you say you should never waste a, a crisis, right? What's that? A crisis is a terrible thing to waste. That's not original with me. That was a, a Stanford economist named uh, Roller, but uh, it is true. It, it, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste and we shouldn't do it. Well, and, and again, the finish the quote there, stressful situations help us understand our truly profound strengths and fatal flaws. I, let me tell you my experience here. When we've done groups in the pandemic here, the feedback is golden. Uh, people are really impressed. And, and, you know, it's easy for you to be 
stressed or, or, or to be tested and when everything's going well. This is a difficult period. And so it really makes a big difference. So Dan, we're handing it off to you. Jump in and, and let us know where we go from here. Okay, well, well thank you, Joe and uh, Jack. And thanks again, everyone, for attending today's webinar. My Zenger Fultman colleagues and I, we certainly hope you found the uh, information Joe and Jack shared with you today valuable. Now, in just a couple of minutes, I'm gonna to conclude today's webinar by sharing how and where you can get, a, get more information about the research and insights that uh, Joe and Jack described. But first, I wanna speak briefly to those of you who are, who are interested in learning a bit more about how Zenger Fultman can possibly help your organization develop the essential skills of its leaders. Now, we know here at Zenger Fultman from long experience that the organizations we work with differ widely in their preferred approaches, for developing their leaders. For example, some of our clients, they prefer to simply provide their leaders access to development resources that they can individually choose to uh, take advantage of or not. Other clients prefer to develop their leaders in groups. Uh, we've worked with small groups of three to five leaders as well as large groups of several hundred leaders. What's become abundantly clear over the last few months, however, and for obvious reasons, is that the vast majority of our clients have a new or perhaps renewed focus on developing their leaders in a virtual setting. So with all of that in mind, uh, Zenger Fultman had again developed multiple options uh, for helping organizations as and assess and develop the essential skills of their leaders. Now all of these options I'm about to share with you are available in a virtual setting. I wanna make sure that uh, I emphasize that. So we at Zenger Fultman, we believe an important first step for improving the leader's effectiveness is to first determine their current level of effectiveness. And that's why all of our development programs begin with an assessment. There are three options available uh, for helping your leaders understand their current level of effectiveness. As you can see here on this slide, the first is a self-assessment option in which the leader will respond to nine challenging questions uh, from which we will produce a report for them uh, that provides insights into how well he or she is uh, currently demonstrating the essential skills. The second, uh, a leader can complete our very well-known Extraordinary Leader 360 degree uh, assessment in which their manager, their direct reports, their peers and others will provide their perspective on how well the leader is demonstrating the essential skills as well as other important leadership skills. And finally, and th th third and finally, in terms of our assessment options, for our clients, and there are many out there who have leaders who have previously completed the Extraordinary Leader 360 assessment, we can create for them a separate report from that previous assessment data that will provide them insight into their effectiveness at the five essential skills. Before I leave the assessment options, I just wanna, many of you already know this on this call, but for those of you who don't, in addition to getting insight into how well they're currently performing in these essential skills, they'll also, and very importantly, see how are they, comp they performing compared to the world's best leaders. And we provide information on that, we think, uh, we, we know from feedback from our clients, everybody finds value. So those are the assessment options. Let's turn to the development options. Again, there are three options uh, and your leaders would participate in any one of these three um, after they've completed the assessment, beginning with a self-study option in which uh, the leader will be, be provided the tools and information they need to work independently on their own. A second option is the leader will receive private coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching provided by a Zenger Fultman uh, consultant and finally, we've developed a virtual workshop uh, for groups of leaders, of course, that a Zenger Fultman consultant can, um, can conduct for obviously a group of leaders. And that workshop, by the way, lasts approximately two hours. Now, the key outcome of all three of these options is that the participating leader will leave the experience having identified which one or perhaps two essential skills they're going to focus on uh, for further development, as well as having crafted a specific plan for doing that. So, uh, so many of you are, I know on the chats that I've been monitoring here, many of you have been asking, where do I get more information? So I wanna let you know that if you would like more information on the research and the insights that Joe and Jack shared with you today, please go to the website you see here on this slide. And we'll first ask you to complete a brief survey about today's webinar. And you can let us know at this same website if you would like to speak with a Zenger Fultman representative about the assessment and development options I just described for you. 
So thank you again for attending today's webinar. Again, we, we certainly hope you uh, enjoyed and valued it and enjoy the rest of your day and goodbye for now.